We have five extraordinary qualities that define us as Bhutanese. These are the five extraordinary qualities that you possess. The acronym for these extraordinary qualities of the Bhutanese, sincerity, mindfulness, astuteness, resilience and timelessness, is S-M-A-R-T, smart. We must nurture these wonderful qualities and remember every day how they have defined us as a nation and as a people. We must remember that these qualities will help us navigate the 21st century and build an even better place. His Majesty the King. Kuzuzambola. Welcome to UN House. Our team today is Values and Equality in the 21st Century. I had to spend a lot of time googling and learning about what values actually mean. So for example, those of you who have a connection with Germany will know that there is a museum of values, a museum of values 200 kilometers west of Berlin. So here you have a country choosing to have a museum of values. <coughs> so why are values important? I've spoken to a number of people. Some people believe that values can help us decide never to jump the line at the hospital when there is a queue. I spoke to other people and other people said values will help you decide how to decide a tough decision. So for example, if you're working with the United Nations or a CSO and you hear that one of your colleagues is taking too much money for traveling, what's called DSA travel, then you can remind your friend not to take too much money, to take what is, is right, her right. They can also help you take the right decisions in your career. And somebody else suggested to me, if you have good values in terms of love, you can find a good partner. The speaker today is, and I wish to welcome Swami Agnivesh to Bhutan. Swamiji is widely known for his campaign against bonded labor. He's a former member of the Haryana Legislative Assembly and a former Minister for Education in Haryana. He served as chairperson of the United Nations Voluntary Trust Fund on Contemporary Forms of Slavery. He has been arrested twice, spending a total of 14 months in jail on charges of subversion, of which he was later acquitted. He is a scholar, an activist, a spiritual leader. <clears throat> some areas for me stand out, and I hope some of you ask questions about them. He has an incredible commitment to gender equality. He sees youth as one of the main hopes for the future. When it comes to climate crisis, it can be very surprising because even in the midst of the crisis that he believes climate are, will bring to us, he sees an opportunity. Let me hand it over to you, Dr. Khan. So, Namaste, Swamiji. Namaste. <laughs> Welcome to Bhutan Dialogues. Uh, it's a great honor for us to have you here. You are, I think, the first foreign guest we have who have specifically come for the Bhutan Dialogues from outside of Bhutan. So thank you for taking the time and trouble to be with us. And in your little like book... Thank Jerry Gerald. In your little book, Applied Spirituality, which I've been reading since yesterday, you say, it's a spiritual duty to seek. And to seek is to go beyond familiar stereotypes. To seek is, in effect, to become subversive of the status quo. 
Seeking is the strategy for liberation, and the purpose of freedom is the pursuit of truth. Bhutan Dialogues is a forum exactly for that, Swamiji. We hope this to be a space where we can have cordial debates and civil conversations to stretch the boundaries of thinking. A forum where I often say in a Buddhist uh, idiom to practice mindful listening, right speech, and critical thinking. So uh, it's a great honor for us to have you here with us. Um, Jerry has already introduced you as a spiritual figure, a political leader, a negotiator, and above all, a social activist. So I often begin the conversation by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to be who you are right now, a social activist and a, a Swamiji, a sannyasin. Can you very briefly take us the audience through your life story. Yeah, thank you so much, Karma Kwanza. And thank you all my friends. It's indeed a great honor for me huh, to be the first from outside of Bhutan to come and share my views here for the Bhutan Dialogue. And I'm indeed very, very grateful to my <coughs> old friend, Gerald Dali for bringing me here and when I would like to share my views, I would like to see this whole conversation, a true dialogue. It should not degenerate into a monologue because normally when I, whenever I get invited, people introduce me and want me to speak at the end of the whole thing, a few questions from the floor and that is taken for the format. But let us make it more brainstorming, make it more dialogue, dialogic, rather than monologic. And therefore, please treat me as your friend. You might see me in this robe of a Swami Sanyasi, but uh, this might be a little deceptive also. Mm. <laughs> might give you the aura of a guru or a swami. Is, you know, normally we uh, come across many such people in India and abroad also. But I'm not that. I'm basically a human rights activist, social activist. But inspiration is basically spiritual. The spirituality as it obtains in the Vedas, as interpreted scientifically by the founder of Adi Samaj, Swami Dayanand Saraswati. Mm. And that is what changed my whole life. So whatever I'm going to share have not been my views from the birth. I was born into a very, very orthodox Brahmin family of South India mm. called Shikakulam, which is a part of Andhra Pradesh, but the particular town now into Ganjam district of Odisha. And then when I lost my father at the age of four, I was brought up by my maternal grandfather, who was a Diwan, sort of a chief minister of a princely state in Chhattisgarh area, uh, central India. And uh, he was the one who brought me up. And being a devout Brahmin, practicing Brahmin, he had set up a room for gods and goddesses, temple room in the house. And as a little child, I would follow his footsteps, worshipping all those gods, goddesses, mm. without realizing the metaphorical meaning or any message behind those. So I had childlike questions. How come this god has got one head, another got three or four? Uh, how do they use the pillow when they <laughs> so I will be shouted down, shut up, don't ask such nonsense questions. <laughs> and then I would be asking how come this god looks like an elephant, another like a tiger, another like a monkey. So they all stay in the same room. So very, very childish questions, but I would never be answered perhaps I had expected them to answer, but they didn't know themselves. <laughs> they have been doing it by habit. So this is the way I was brought up. And I would be told by my other elders that because you ask these wrong questions, you better be prepared 
the ghost will come and pick you up. <laughs> so I was very afraid of bhoot, bhoot. In India, call them bhoot. Mm. They say, how do they look like? They, they are invisible. Now, how am I going to fight? Uh, there's this no way. When you are sleeping, they will quietly come and pick you up, disappear. My goodness. So who can protect me? And Lord Hanuman. So how to pray Hanuman? Hanuman Chalisa. Mm. Jai Hanuman, Gyan Bun Sagar. Like that, you know, I would chant loud enough so that wherever Hanuman he has gone, he would come and protect me for the night. My other brothers and sisters, you have to go to sleep, go to bed earlier, and tell me that you chant Hanuman Chalisa on our behalf also. <laughs> I would do it five times. So very early in my life, I got to know that in the world of religion, there is a particular department where you don't have to do it yourself, and benefits can be transferred. <laughs> So now I see the whole world of religions uh, where the priests are working overtime, 24 by 7, praying for saving the souls of others. I call it multi-billion dollar soul saving industry. <laughs> I'm sorry for using this. So anyway, and then I would practice caste system and disability towards those poor laborers who would be working in my farm many other things and so on and so forth. Gender inequality was very much part of all this thing. For three days every month, my family members, women, would become untouchable for me. Not just those farm laborers, also those ladies. So this way I was brought up. And superstitions, stepping outside <coughs> of school, and if a cat would cross my way, it would be inauspicious. So all of these things, met me, I was good at studies, but very weak in my whole, and I went on. And whenever I would have some questions, I would be told it's a matter of faith, mm. don't ask questions. Mm. Shraddha, Vishwas, mm. that's it. But it was a little grace of God, I would say, when I <coughs> went to Calcutta for my college education, I chanced upon this great movement, which was a turning point called Arya Samaj. And from the day one, they encouraged me to ask more and more questions. And when I studied Swami Dayanand's book, Satyarth Prakash, Light of Truth, it's written in the question-answer form. I was thrilled. And the central message of Swami Dayanand was, three Ds. Three Ds inspired me most. The first D is to doubt. So when I'm starting this dialogue, dialogue will be the fourth one. But the first D's are very important. To doubt, the second is to debate, and third one, wherever, whenever necessary, to dissent, D-I-S-S-E-N-T. That became part of my whole inner evolution after the age of 70. College, university, and then I started teaching business management law in St. Davis College, Calcutta. So there are many other challenges, and I left everything behind and went to Haryana to work among the poorest of the poor, farmers, laborers, etc. 1968, more than 50 years, and I got into this whole new initiation. So ever since I've been for 50 long years, a human rights social activist. <clears throat> but I try to develop whole of my life in a holistic manner. Sometimes we make a religion one compartment, and politics another one, and this and that. Environmental activism is separate, or gender activism is separate. But I try to put them all together. Holistic approach to life, society, and all its problems. So that is one thing. Yeah. But this is what uh, I want to ask you, Swamiji. Um, around the same time you became a full-time member of uh, Arya Samaj, you also became a sannyasin. And then, almost the same day, according to your biography, you also started the political wing of yes. Arya Samaj. So how could you reconcile the spiritual uh, leaning you had with the political movement you started? Because here in Bhutan, we have very clear partition of politics and religion. Yes. You see, in 1968 itself, 
I, together with my other friends and colleagues, we started a march from the place of Kurukshetra, very well known mm. place, to the ramparts of the Red Fort in Delhi. And as we were marching, 200 of us, young people, young men, then we would be hosted, welcomed by the poor villagers, farmers, and they would give us the best whatever they had for food and other things. And at the end of this whole thing, we would ask them, what is we can do for you? And they would say, no, 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 it's good enough that you came to our village. Mm -hmm. That's it. I said, no, no, please tell us why you are not in good shape. You are working so hard like animals and yet you don't have enough of, of you know, good living. So at the end of the whole conversation, they would say, if you really want to do something good for us, please remove this little uh, shop, wooden shop. What is that shop? Alcohol, liquor shop. Who set it up? The government. Who voted this government into power? We voted. Why don't you ask your government to stop it? They don't listen to us. <coughs> they came to ask for votes, but now they don't want to listen to mm. us. So first time we learned that there is a disconnect in democracy. There is a chemical change in the leaders. <laughs> <laughs> and before election and after election. So that was our first sort of a new lessons which we learned. And then we started campaigning against alcoholism, mm. etc., mm. which was causing a lot of domestic violence and accidents and disease, etc., etc. Anyway, so that landed us in jail. Mm. And not twice, you said two times. No, 11 times I was in <laughs> But taking up issues which are already there in our constitution. Indian constitution says there should be no intoxicant, Article 47 throughout the country. Mm. And yet, the very governments who swear by the Indian constitution, they make it as the main source of their revenue, mm. excise, in this way. Mm. So one after the other issues, farmers issues, teachers issues, and we would be sent to jail. There was no opposition uh, in the center was Indira Gandhi, in our state was Bansi Lal, and they were like very, very harsh. So. Mm. But every time we went to jail, normally people will say, oh, going to jail is something bad. But it was like a mm -hmm. uh, rest house for us, <laughs> rest, you know. Yeah. We would have time to study or mingle with other prisoners and learn more about society, mm -hmm. things like that. So this way, and every time we come out of the jail, people will give us rousing reception. And we became more popular. Our message went across. Then finally we thought that if this is the object of our whole struggle for social transformation, huh, to fight for gender equality, because women were suffering the most because of alcoholism. And we thought how to overcome this evil. In spite of the constitution, in spite of India's freedom struggle led by Mahatma Gandhi, who said it is more important for me to stop alcoholism than to drive the British out. But it was there. Anyway, so we thought we must get into politics mm. and wield power. Then only we can change mm. or bring about the change which we want to. Without power, we cannot do that. Mm. So with that idea, when we <coughs> embraced full sannyas, first two years were like novitiate, nastic brahmachari, mm. and then sannyasi. On the same day, from the same platform, we announced that we are not becoming sannyasi to run away from society and <coughs> the challenges of life, but to take them head on. Mm. And that's how we are announcing formation of a new political party. Mm. The philosophy is Vedic Socialism, which means spiritual socialism, egalitarian, equality, justice, will inform us. <coughs> and that was the beginning in 1970. And then we became such a, uh, so very popular in that state of Haryana. People simply left us up and we became a threat for the powers that be. Because you also left politics quite soon after that. So 
um, did a chemical change happen in uh, your colleagues or uh, someone as well? Uh, or you found that political position is not the best to have to make these social transformations? What happened? No, no, no. I still hold that mm. politics is as much integral mm. to spirituality. Mm. See? But the commitment to truth, honesty, simplicity, transparency, these are spiritual values. But to bring them into politics mm. becomes very, very challenging. And every time I try to do this, my own party leaders, mm. they thought it was too much. And they ultimately threw me out of the party. <laughs> oh, you see? Mm. So mm. Mm -hmm. being truthful and also uh, practicing those values and remaining in politics and rising in politics, mm. it's, very, very difficult. Mm. So not that now I'm not in politics, but I do sort of intervene mm. on and off. Mm. But I feel that this electoral <coughs> politics is slightly different game, mm. not my cup of tea in that sense. Mm. But whenever opportunity comes, I'm open. Mm. So. But you have been most well known as a social activist. Uh, and uh, one of the areas where you have become very well known is for bonded labor. Um, what is the situation of bonded labor in India today? And yeah. What have you achieved in these many decades of work? Yeah. There was an emergency declared in India. Mm. Many of you might be familiar with that. In 1975, first six months I was underground fighting against the then regime. And later on, I surfaced and went to jail. During my time in jail, I had the great opportunity to study Gandhi's books, his idea, his philosophy. And then, to my great fascination, I found his ideas were, you know, much, much challenging. So, first thing I read about Gandhi was that when he was in Johannesburg, in the tall star farm, one day, he started cleaning uh, the toilets, his own and others. And then he prevailed upon Kasturba Gandhi, his wife, mm -hmm. to do that. And then I asked myself, if Gandhi could do it, Agnivesh, why don't you do it inside the jail? Mm -hmm. But it was very disturbing, because the jail toilets were dry, latrin, uh, and stinking, foul, <laughs> impossible. And yet I picked up courage after two, three days of inner debate. And then I ventured out and I cleaned for the first time, being born Brahmin and cleaning the toilets, just the opposite. And then I did the second day, third day, all those months I was there, nearly 13 months. And the story goes on after I came out, so many other things, but paucity of time I am not going to dwell at length. The second thing what Gandhi came up was really, really something very, very profound. And it is said about Gandhi that he shared his uh, magic formula, which is called uh, something like uh, Antyodaya or unto this last. Gandhi, when he was traveling from Joburg to Durban in a train, he chanced upon a small book by one John Ruskin, European Christian mm -hmm. philosopher unto this last. And he became so uh, overtaken by that. So he prescribes that whenever India is free and you have to chart out a development plan, don't trust the trickle down or percolation theory from ever to the poor. No, it will never, never work. It has to start from bottom upwards, from the poorest of the poor whoever you have come across. Mm. My goodness! I was teaching economic development in Calcutta University and I had so much other things, all other mm. philosophies, but I never come across this particular... And in one sentence he defined the whole thing. <coughs> that if you are in doubt, not knowing which course to take, close the door of your office, sit alone, close your eyes, Imagine the face of the poorest of the poor you have ever come across in your life. Ask yourself a simple question. Is it going to empower that least among the last first to begin with or not? And if your heart and mind tells you yes, 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 
go ahead with all fury. But if your mind is little in doubt, says no, no, not to begin with, maybe, finally, ultimately, the rich will get richer and more richer, richer and richer, and then something will percolate and trigger. Don't trust that. That was Gandhi's message. But unfortunately, our whoever rulers, they never listen to Gandhi, though they pay their you know, respect to him. <coughs> so, this is where we lost Gandhi. And still we are following that trickle-down theory of development. What has really inspired me when I reached Bhutan? Uh, my friend Jerry gave me a bunch of those lectures by your His Majesty, the King Five. And I'm so thrilled to know his views. I had not expected from a young man of uh, 40 years, half my age, um, 80 years, with those gems of wisdom, very much like Gandhi's thoughts. The priority is land reform and poorest of the poor, equality, spirituality. All of these things, when I read his lectures, one after the other, the other, I found the uh, sort of a resonance in Gandhian thoughts and the whole development philosophy also of Gandhi. So I think Bhutan really is blessed and I am blessed, I am feeling myself blessed. I though never had the opportunity to meet him in person. I look forward to my next and next visits. So our youthful king is really very, very inspiring. And day before yesterday, or was it yesterday, our CSOs came, this Om Dorji. She told me something very uh, amazing, which I couldn't believe. Some Indians wanted to see King's Palace. Whenever we talk about a king, palace is important. So they insisted, we want to go and see the palace. And when they were taken to that place, where is the palace? There was none. It's like a, any other simple house, like a cottage. And see the amount of respect people have for the king. He could easily have made himself into a cult figure or a benevolent dictator sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the king four insisted in bringing democracy. Great, great. And each individual citizen of Bhutan, as important as anybody else, equality. And begin from the lowest of the low. So I think it's a great inspiration for not only Bhutan, but for us Indians also. And I'm going to take this message back to India and wherever I travel. So I think uh, Bhutan can become a role model in terms of your GNH, of course, but at the same time, the role of the king and your prime minister and the whole parliament and everything. So what was your question? Yes. I deviated. So, huh? Yes, uh, I was asking about what the bonded labor situation yeah, is in India right now. Yeah. Um, but I think we can move on. Um, no, no, no. Bonded <laughs> labor, because Gandhi spoke about the least among the last, the most voiceless, etc. So then I, at the, in the time in jail itself, I dedicated myself. Whenever opportunity comes my way, I will work and be the voice of the voiceless. But after coming out of the jail, I was elected as legislator, then minister, first, and then I resigned on a note of protest against my own government and went to the stone quarries and the brick kilns of Haryana where I found hundreds and thousands languishing in conditions of modern day slavery. They are being bought and sold like animals in general. And then I plunged headway. And then I was threatened by the same chief minister under whom I had worked. With dire consequences, he told me, I will get you killed if you continue with this campaign against my state. You think bonded labor in my state? No, it's a very progressive state. Anyway, mm. then I had to go to the Supreme Court, file a writ petition. That's the first writ petition which starts with for this PIL, public interest litigation, mm. in our jurisprudence. Anyway, mm. so this way it became mm. a mission with me. Mm. And in last about 38, 9 years of my struggle with my colleagues, friends, 
including my friend Prabhat Kumar, who is accompanying me, we have been able to liberate 178,000 bonded laborers, including several thousand child bonded laborers, slaves, and rehabilitate them, start a new life for them. So that is, and that's how I got into that position of the UN for three yes. terms. So it's still a passion. Even last week we got bonded laborers released from a place in Haryana. So I continue with that mission, but now I am going on to the macro level issues. Why is there no minimum wage being implemented? Because the judgment says anything less than minimum wage is tantamount to forced labor. Anything forced labor is bonded labor. So that is the historic landmark judgment, which is a law unto itself, Supreme Court judgment. But that is not being implemented. So now my mission is to fight for a national minimum wage and then get it implemented and equal for men and women, organized sector and unorganized sector, everything. So that's it. Another area where you have also worked is um, for gender equality, as Jerry pointed out earlier, and you seem to have had a Pat Yatra campaign for, uh, um, against Sati, you know, emulation mm. of widows, and also for female futurists. That Those seem to have resulted in some kind of legislative uh, outcomes, but are they being implemented? Are you happy with the outcomes, or is India still struggling with the same challenges? Well, thank you for asking this question. <clears throat> Back in India, <coughs> I'm known as a social activist, but also as a male feminist. <laughs> <laughs> because first time I felt challenged by none other than the high priest of Jagadguru Shankaracharya Puri. On 4th of September 1987, a young woman, her name Rup Kumar, a beautiful woman, name itself. She was consigned to flames by her in-laws and everybody in the name of religion they call Sati in an obscure little village of Rajasthan. And it's a long story but I'll cut it short. And she was consigned to fire and she died. So he was trying to justify this Jagat Guru Shankaracharya. It's a revival of the great, great uh, our tradition. Mm. So I said, what nonsense? How can you justify in this age and time? He said, no, no, it was all voluntary. No, it mm. cannot be voluntary. Mm. You know, she was shouting for help, but they did not inform her parents <coughs> who were hardly 65 kilometers away in Jaipur, Rajasthan. Mm. Because if she had decided to go back and live, mm. she could have claimed property rights in her Disease husband's property, also the dowry which she had brought 40 tolas of gold and 25,000 rupees of fixed deposit, she would have taken by. So, very neatly, nicely, they said she has become sati. So, I was outraged and I challenged him for a public debate. He didn't join. So, then I organized a march from Delhi to Devarala on foot for. 18 days long, long, 5th of December till 23rd of December in that biting winter cold. At that time, we had this young youthful Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Because of that uh, awareness created against Sati practice, <coughs> then he introduced a bill in the parliament, Sati Prevention Act 1987. Mm which not only prevents this sati incident as such, even glorification by word of mouth is punishable mm. with seven years of rigorous imprisonment. That's real deterrent mm. act. Mm. But it's not stopped. being implemented mm. in that sense mm. because many things are happening by way of denying women equality. Mm. So we are still fighting property rights, mm. equal, mm. economic equality, we say. Mm income equality, wages equality, and also organizational equality, in politics equality. Everywhere women should have 50% share, you know. 
So that type of a struggle is still going on. And uh, yeah. so um, on Sati, I just want to add a note here. Many Bhutanese rulers in the past, in the 18th century, 19th century, have tried to stop Sati along the border regions uh, over which Bhutan had some control. Um, but then one issue that Bhutan and India seem to share is uh, temple access for the women, especially menstruating women. And we generally believe that it's a culture that we have uh, acquired, that we have got from India, a Brahmanical culture. Uh, there are many issues in India, such as Sabarma, Vimala, temple so, issues. Yeah. Um, how do you address it? Is there anything that we can learn from India to overcome this kind of uh, gender discrimination? Well. As I said, this uh, march against Sati, another two years I fought for Dalit. Dalit means the untouchables entry into North Dwara temple in Rajasthan. Mm. Finally, <laughs> we succeeded. So at that time, temple entry was one of my major issues. Mm. Later on, I realized, what are these temples? Mm. Who creates these temples? We create it. We human beings create temples with brick and mortar, whatever, and call it sacred. And then there is some sort of an urge for others to enter into it. Mm. But then I realized the most sacred and the most precious temple each one of us already has. Mm. That is this body, a living, pulsating, throbbing body. This human body, as Jesus said, kingdom of God is within you. And I think this is the message of the Vedas also. Mm. Each one of us is carrying a temple, far more sacred than all the temples of the world put together, far more precious than all the churches, mosques mm. and gurdwaras put together. Each one of us. Make this a real temple. Mm. Now when we call that other temple sacred, we pick up a fight if somebody smokes a cigarette and throws the butt or a piece of meat or alcohol or anything. But this most sacred temple which the Creator gives us, we go on pouring alcohol inside and <laughs> meat inside and dobekovo and everything, everything, it never gets polluted. It's far more sensitive. Even an evil thought, anger, greed pollutes this sacred <coughs> temple. So now I'm trying to evolve further. And I'm telling my friends there that don't too much fight for this temple. Mm. You better fight for your entering to the parliament mm. where you can become the decision maker. <coughs> That's it. I mean, another way. Yeah, well, this takes me to uh, the other <coughs> issue in which you are involved um, the kind of a reactionary uh, movement you have to the institutionalized uh, forms of religion. So instead of seeing these sacred temples out there built of brick and mortar, you want people to see your own body as a sacred temple. Um, but that's a major challenge, isn't it? It's bringing about a sort of a societal change in terms of our mindset and worldviews. Um, is it a realistic yeah. project? It's a very, very realistic and very, very simple demystifying because religions are all rituals mind-boggling. Mm. Nobody knows the meaning and yet they are practicing. <laughs> and dogmas mm. and a go-between. There can be no religion without a priest mm. or a mullah or somebody, somebody. Okay. Why do we need that? Mm. Hmm? If the God is all-pervasive in the whole of the universe, every subatomic particle, which we call Sarva Vyapak, mm. hmm? and nirakar. Whatever is all pervasive cannot have any form by definition. And therefore, God is inside of us, God is outside of us. God or Allah, or whatever name you can want to give, or just say truth. Mm. The cosmic energy of truth, love, compassion and justice is God. Mm. Simple. Mm. Each one of us has access to that. Meditate on for 10 minutes, mm. half an hour on that. Mm. Mm. Purify your heart and mind. Mm. And then when you get up, yeah. then see all around you in the world, the forces of untruth, unfreedom, tyranny, injustice, anywhere, everywhere, feel challenged. 
and raise your voice against it. That is proactive social spirituality. Mm. It's complete. Mm. But if you look at history, so and it's a yeah. transformational mm. uh, value. Mm. Religions are for status quo. Mm. Huh? They are not at all subversive of the status quo. Mm. They try to maintain uh, like Marx said, it's like an opium. Mm. You know. Mm. So I, mm. I'm inclined to agree with Karl Marx. Mm. And mm. therefore, we need something called a spirituality, mm. which is distinct from religions, mm. ritualistic, dogmatic, superstitions, mm. etc. And a spirituality which is evolving within and also helps you mm. for transformation, mm. social transformation. See? Mm. It's, it's, I fully agree with you. It's a wonderful ideal to pursue. But then, if you look at history, people like Buddha have already started such a movement, but then these systems have themselves sort of contradicted their original purpose by becoming established institutions, as you point out in your book. Um, the same seems to have also happened with your own organization, Arya Samaj, yes. that uh, what was supposed to be universal and open um, seems to have now become, in the eyes of some people, even nationalistic and uh, yeah. aggressive towards the Christians and the Muslims. So, very right, very right. Mm. The thing is, you know, every generation, mm. and I'm so glad to see so many young people here, mm. feel challenged. Mm. Bring out the subversive element within you. Mm. Uh, subversive in the sense you want to bring about transformation. Mm. And the first thing you will realize that the accident of your birth has denied you the freedom to choose your own religion. They all talk about freedom of religion. But tell me, who has really enjoyed this freedom? You are just born into a family and the parents and the elders thrust upon their own mm. ritualistic, dogmatic religion on you. And you are told, oh, you are a Hindu, you are a Muslim, you are a Brahmin, you are this and that, Shia or Sunni, Catholic, Protestant, this and that, all devising. Why aren't parents and elders giving every child the freedom to choose one's own religion and that freedom in order to be effectively exercised needs informed choice. Mm. You cannot make an informed choice unless you are 18 years old. Yes. So wait till the 18 years of age mm. and then give that freedom to the young people either to be Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Sikh or a Buddhist or whatever institutionalized religion or to be none at all, just a simple human being. So that is what I have chosen for myself. Mm. If you ask me, I am neither a Hindu, nor a Muslim, mm. nor a Christian. Mm. I am only a human being. But Swami, um, you, you are leading Arya Samaj. No, you are dressed you also <laughs> in uh, orange robes. Uh, it's very difficult to deny that you are a Hindu Swami. No, no, this is where we are mistaken. This color, has nothing to do with Hindu or Muslim. In fact, when I was embracing this order, I inquired about it. And I was informed that this has nothing to do with any religion or religiosity. Mm. It is the color, it's not even orange, not even uh, mm. saffron. It is the color of the fire, the flame. Mm. Yeah? And that's why I chose my name, new name. Earlier my name used to be Vipashyam Rao. Then I was given this new name and my teacher was kind enough to say, what name you would like? Normally it is their prerogative to give me the name. Then I said, look, I love this symbol of fire. So my name is Agni Vesh, embodiment of fire. You are nodding your head. I <laughs> don't... <laughs> Uh, be surprised if the fire alarm goes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <Are> we invited? <laughs> I, I would like to ask my last question before we open to the audience, yeah. and uh, it's a slightly personal one. Um, last year in September, huh. you were uh, harassed and beaten up by some fundamentalist mm -hmm. uh, groups in Jharkhand. What was your reaction? <coughs> what went through your head, and what did you feel? How did you react? Is there anything we can learn, the young people can learn from that? You see, I, I was <coughs> given up hope. I thought 
I will die. It was a lynch mob which didn't want to talk to me or argue with me, just attacked me. I have been to that place in Jharkhand at the invitation of 150,000 poor tribals. They wanted to be sensitized about their land rights and right to the minerals, etc. as per our Indian constitution. But our governments are transferring all the land to big corporates for some other purpose and tribals are being denied. So somehow it was organized the attack to silence me, not allowing me to reach that public meeting. And when they started beating me and completely, you know, I was pushed down for 10 minutes. So I thought I will be dead. But by God's grace, I am still alive. What I thought at that time, this, when you think of religion, and as I was sharing with you, superstitions are very much integral, integral part of religions. And as a social activist, human, I question these superstitions, even if they are being preached by the highest in the country or being upheld, upheld by. So I question them, high priest or political leaders or whoever. I said, no, no. Let every child find out the truth for himself, herself, through common sense. You don't have to read a lot of philosophy. Don't impose this in the name of faith, all of this. And that is too much for them. Mm. They want to make use of religions to mobilize to sort of things, you know, mm. for political purposes, which I'm up against. I'm against institutionalized religions and also against superstition mongering and obscurantism in the name of religion. Mm. That is the inspiration I got from Swami Dayanam. Mm. Anyway, so I took up that challenge much more vigorously from that day onwards. Mm. And I decided... So it made you stronger? Stronger in my determination mm. because I thought I got a new lease of life. Mm. And it's God who gave me this new lease of life. Therefore, I must serve this message of God or mm. mission of uh, spirituality much more effectively. Mm. And there was just a month later, I was again attacked. In Delhi itself, where I was going to pay my last respect to our great leader Atal Bihari Bajpayee, he had passed uh, on 16th of August. This first one was on 17th of July, and 17th of August again I was attacked, and I was, and when they were attacking me in Jharkhand, they were all office bearers of this big political party, and they were shouting a slogan Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Ram. What is Ram to do with this type of <laughs> lynch mob? Another time they said, traitor, traitor, gaddar hai. Uh, how am I gaddar? So, anyway, but I could really see. So I don't know those people, neither did they know me, but something is being sponsored, thing like that, which is unfortunate. But I am trying to work at a higher level, broader level and trying to bring together the whole of humanity into this rational thinking, reason thinking, etc. Dharma and not religion. Dharma is universal. And I am started a new movement, not Arya Samaj. Arya Samaj, because of institutionalized character, uh, has lost its real moorings. And now I am working for a new movement and where I would like to invite each one of you and more of your friends and that is Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the whole universe is a family. Whole universe is a family. So that's a beautiful concept. Mm. Not just humanity is a family. Mm. Or earth is a family. Whole universe, which means all living creatures are part of our extended family. Mm. And if we want to bring about whole sort of a system of what Buddha called Ahimsa, mm. then we have to respect their life also. Not just kill them and eat them. Mm. Um, every day we are killing one billion birds, animals, mm. one billion, hundred crores every day. Now that should go. Because that is the main reason for climate crisis. Mm. 
एनिमल फार्म इंडस्ट्री इन द वर्ल्ड टूडे वन सिंगल इंडस्ट्री द सिंगल बिगेस्ट फैक्टर फॉर ग्रीन हाउस गैसेस थैंक यू स्वामी जी आई थिंक नाउ वी विल इनवाइट क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस आपका नाम की बोल रहे प्रतिका प्रधान प्रधान of the voice he is this to empower the least among the last <coughs> you say you are giving the voice or being the voice of the voiceless but ultimately hmm, the women of the world need to be empowered <coughs> to be their own voice they are the most discriminated numbers all around the world and more so in our part of the world not so much perhaps in bhutan but talking about bangladesh and yeah, india and the world and secondly that it's an indigenous people whom we call tribals landless people asetless people bonded labor child labor such other people need to be empowered and uh, the way to go about is give them their economic rights for it is already enshrined in your constitution fight for those rights which are guaranteed in the constitution be the voice take it to the courts or to the media social media or whatever that way you <coughs> <they> realize <coughs> that what you are saying being the voice of the voiceless is not something your gift or anything it is already inherent in their human rights or citizen rights And that realization will empower them like anything, and then help them organize. Most of our people, women included, are unorganized. The small, small organizations like you have the <coughs> CSOs here and you know, social enterprises. So these organizations can take up and become a real a voice for transformation. My name is Uttam Gale, and I am also a recent graduate from Shams College. Uh, which is in the east of Bhutan. Uh, my question here is uh, regarding uh, religion, religion and the security of a country. So, in in our country, Bhutan, our king is always concerned about the security of the country. Where I found that, uh, as you have said, that one of one phrase you have said is, "Whole universe is a family." Mm. Similar to that, uh, there are also some people who says that. all religion are same and in the name of that all religion they are bringing up new religion which is which says that that all religion is a new i mean like same really i mean same so in that uh, name they are bringing new religion so uh, this might be not a very big issue but there are some underground uh, things that are going that mm. new uh, there are some new i mean like people who are converting themselves uh, into Uh, some religion which are uninformed as you say informed religion uninformed religion so what the problem here is that because of this new religion and uh, you know like new religion and uninformed conversion of people from you know one religion to another there is a problem of threat to mona threat to uh, security of the country uh, as i believe that uh, as i have seen that there are some people who Uh, even do not 
sing the national anthem because they think that it is a Buddhist, so they don't they don't sing. So that's a real uh, you know like, and some portion of people there are, there are people who think that way. So Swamiji, what is your say on this? That because of religion, there's uh, you know a security threat to the country. Yes. Uh, and also, I would also like to hear views from Dr. Farman Funsuk about regarding this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We'll give the time to Swami for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see, I was reading uh, some of these speeches of uh, His Majesty, and I was amazed to see that he wants to empower the youth, you know, irrespective of whatever religion, etc. And he talks about security not in terms of army and defense, but every citizen, every individual. That's a great thing, number two. He wants to sort of give equal opportunities in terms of education, healthcare, etc., etc. That is the Bhutan uh, now emerging. And then he also goes on to say that it's not just this happiness model or whatever, not only for Bhutan, for the whole world. And we should see our happiness in the common good. Self, we need to transcend and work for the common good. Now when I <coughs> question these religions, I am questioning only the institutionalized, ritualized, dogmatic, obscurantist part of it. But if you look at the core values of all of these religions, you will find them essentially spiritual, universal. See, they talk about truth, love, compassion, justice, core values. And they are common to all religions and even to non-religious traditions like humanist traditions or even atheistic <laughs> traditions. Now that is where we meet. Yes? That is the sense of the spirituality. We need to promote and develop through scientific temper, through spirit of inquiry, through humanism. <coughs> now, if this is our approach, it is not going to be another religion. And if you give me your names and uh, mobile number, which is WhatsApp, I will send you my little write-up, which I took to <coughs> World Economic Forum four years ago. And everybody liked it. So, in that I am concluding my whole argument by saying that this Vasudeva Kutumbakam will not have any head. You see, institutions means head, somebody. No head. And no headquarter. The children will lead this movement. Children, school children, college students, university students. And we will not have a headquarter, only heart quarter. <laughs> that specifically I mentioned. No bank account. Hmm? So we have to take little precaution. It has to be remain a movement. If it does not remain a movement, it will degenerate into a monument, which most of our religions are degenerated into. So we have to be as cautious as possible that we don't create another new religion and ask people to convert into it. We are very right in that. I have a, an add-on question to that. Yes. Uh, following <coughs> your Vasudeva Kumbu, uh, Kumbukam uh, <laughs> uh, concept of uh, universal family, now you have also argued for no visa, no passport uh, world. Bhutan currently um, is having issues with uh, too many people coming into the country as tourists. If we have no visas and passports, would the pristine country that you have just plotted remain the same? Yeah, I mean, you have to decide about that, you know. <laughs> I can't specifically advise on all these issues. How to preserve the pristine nature, uh, everything, you know, it is a great gift. And with a small population of 700,000, that's a great thing. So you welcome foreigners, whoever wants to visit. But 
let them not bring their consumeristic culture, you know, mm. or the big corporates and things like that, which goes with it, you know. So you have to be a little careful. Like I'm told, and I'm thrilled, that some big tobacco companies wanted to come and invest here. <coughs> and they were told, sorry. Mm. Huh? Otherwise, so many people will come in the casinos mm. and whatnot, Mm. And so you will be invaded. So you have to be really very cautious about it. So consumerism, the culture of consumerism, and we are being all condemned to consume and consume and consume. Mm. And commodification of everything, natural resources and everything. That is the bane of our present day culture. We have to fight against it. <coughs> Nature is like a gift. If you read Chief Seattle's letter, when George Washington wanted to buy the land of those natives in the US, he said, how can I sell it to you? I don't own it myself. The forest and the bees and the birds and the rivers, I don't own them. How can I sell it to you? That's a beautiful piece. So we need to preserve the beauty of this and make this also like I was uh, <coughs> discussing with my friend the other day, Buddha Gautam Siddhartha, he was located in this country in a limited area. But his <coughs> message traveled to Sri Lanka, to Thailand, to Japan, to China, all over the world. So now is the time that Bhutan has emissaries. You know, we are coming of age, and this model of development is a shift. Paradigm shift. As I look around the world, I find this is something very inspiring. This is a paradigm shift. More spiritual, more nature, more happiness. Uh, this is a complete new uh, model. And we have health and happiness. And if this could be shared across other countries, and now you have got the UN, hmm? all excellent people. Hmm all of you. So I think this is a real great opportunity for you to, through social media and other things, you can really spread this message worldwide. Instead of people coming here, tell them, practice it at your home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, introducing the concept of three Gs. <coughs> My question is just to <coughs> set the context, I would like to borrow you a moment, of Brahman in toilet. So, what value do privileged and powerful need to possess promote, to promote equality? Going by your experience, it implies that one has to undergo hard times. So, hadn't you been imprisoned or had experienced that thing, would you have dared, as a Brahmin, to clean the toilet? So, in that context, how can we kind of uh, powerful and privileged few empower those wise listeners at this point. What values does it require? Thank you. Can you put it there <laughs> again? What kind of values uh, would one require to uh, <coughs> make the kind of change you have made to go from a Brahmin to clean the toilets? Uh, was it hardship in the prison that made you clean the toilet? What changed you? Yeah, this very outlook that we are all part of one family. This abominable caste system, which by birth says this person or this child, little child, is niche, niche means very low birth. Mm. Another by birth is high. It's nonsense, utter nonsense. We mm. should reject it completely. And gender inequality. You were right about raising this question, but Today I find, in India we have got goddesses alongside with gods also. Saraswati, Lakshmi, many other goddesses, Hindu culture. But at the same time we are practicing female feticides. <coughs> female feticides. When I was marching for that anti-sati march, the village women working in the fields would come and say, Oh, Swamis. So they will come and gather to seek our blessings. And then I would quietly ask them a simple question. 
What happens if a son is born in your family? So we all rejoice, we celebrate, we distribute sweets, do this, 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 whatever. And then I would say, what happens when a daughter, a girl is born? <coughs> Stunning silence. I say, tell me what you do. Say, well, our custom is to break old earthen pots. I said, breaking old earthen pots is associated with mourning, mm. not celebration. But this has been our custom, they would tell me. So my goodness, this custom has been going on for ages without being questioned or changed. Mm. Then I came back to Delhi after the Yatra. I went around Delhi and I found big, big clinics, doctors practicing ultrasound, finding out the gender of the fetus. And then, if it is male, they would tell the patient or whoever, uh, quietly say, Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Ram, male. <laughs> if it is female, then Jai Matadi, Jai Matadi. Oh, the next doctor is waiting to cut her to bits and throw her out. Abortion. Then I said, this is a much bigger challenge. One certain incident we can fight against, get a law also. Mm. But here was already a law which was not being implemented and there we were the first one to start a march against female criticide all across the country. So that created a lot of awareness. But even now, even now, female criticide is rampant. Not among illiterate poor masses, but among well-to-do, educated families. <laughs> you will find them more in Vasant Vihar <laughs> or Vasant <laughs> area in Delhi rather than in the slums. So, this is a big challenge. So, we have to mm. fight again the mindset. <laughs> the mindset is very, very important. I will take the last question now. Oh, so many hands going up. Um, I think we, we have to give uh, the opportunity to the youngest yes. person. Um, I, was, I was just checking around to see if I knew anyone here, so that just in case I ask a silly question. I'm not embarrassed. I guess I don't know anyone here, so let me ask this. Um, now, my name is Kevin Nangal, and I'm, uh, I'm a high school student studying mm. in Utah High mm. Secondary School. Um, like Dr. Confucius has mentioned, uh, in our country there is uh, a huge difference between uh, spiritualism and politics. So, a uh, spiritualistic decision cannot be made in a political forum, and uh, a decision, a, polit uh, a political decision, cannot be made in a spiritualistic forum. Um, and because of that, and because of this difference in our country, we are able to be who we are today. But uh, considering the fact that recently a lot of uh, new problems and issues is, are happening in our kingdom, I find your ideology of uh, spiritualism being involved in politics maybe uh, another hope for a country like Bhutan. But then while I was hovering over this idea, I realized that if spiritualism was really going to get uh, integrated into politics, what might happen would be uh, there would be naturally uh, a great impact on the economy of the country because it is uh, spiritualistic values. While spiritualistic values uh, are going to overcome politi uh, political values, so what's going to happen is we might have to shut down some industries and uh, mm. we might have to do something about what we are doing. So it might greatly hamper our economic system. And what we are noticing is in countries where economics and politics go hand in hand, we notice that the people are richer, but they are mm. not happy. And in countries where spiritualism and politics are going together, the people are happier about the country is poorer. So, um, you, as you have said, uh, you said that a, hol a holistic view is what you appreciate. And a holistic view is what I would like to hear as well. Um, so, how would you link uh, economics, politics, and spiritualism at the same time, and not only keep our nation great, but keep the people happy as well? And do you think Bhutan can adapt to your ideologies, or do you think our ideology of being separate is better? Oh. Thank you. It's a very, very profound question yes. from one of the youngest. <laughs> very, very. Good. Now, this is the challenge, you know. You don't have any cut and dried solution for all of this. You, as a young person, 
nor your friends. Need to find the solution, the way forward. It may not be one step, may be different, and you learn from your experience. Because it's completely new thing. When I talk about Bhutan and this GNH, people say, oh, how do you measure it? And then I was shared with this 33 different criteria. Now, this is something amazing. A young nation of 700,000 people are challenging the whole world. The great powers, the US and everybody, GDP, GDP. And India is saying we are the fastest growing economy, 7 point GDP. What? But we are also home to the poorest of the poor in the world. <laughs> See? And the whole world wealth, 26 individuals own more than half the world's population. Mm. A disparity. So if you go on following this present day economic model of development, you cannot create this happiness model. There is a contradiction or a conflict. You have to go for simple living and high thinking. Sharing and caring hmm? rather than personal aggrandizement, becoming rich and richer and in terms of wealth and opulence, etc. So happiness and health and environment, as I was sharing with my friend, this climate crisis is a big, big opportunity for all of us. And the world is grappling. Right now when we are sitting here, the whole of Europe is burning with heat waves. You know? Now we are realizing how much harm they have already done in the name of so-called development. So we are realizing it too late, but now still time. And Bhutan can really come up with this loud and clear message that this is not the way to go about. The better way is this one. We don't have all the answers for all the problems, but let's start, make a new beginning. Mm -hmm. Human health and human happiness is the ultimate outlet. Mm -hmm. If you can, and use it with spirituality. Spirituality, science, technology. Mm -hmm. Marry them. Mm -hmm. Normally they are seen to be poles apart or opposed to each other. No. Mm -hmm. Science, technology, and spirituality go hand in hand. And if you can do that, I would love to come any number of times to the town <laughs> and bring my other friends also. Not to buy land and <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, well, just to come and interact with the young people like you. So I think that there is a whole new wave of new generation, you particularly. It's really, really very, very inspiring to see the new uh, movement coming out of these young people all over the mm. world and particularly in this part of the world. Mm. So I think this is a hope. The youth has the hope and now they are being empowered with new science and technology related and also the message of the spirituality that we are all one family. There is only one planet, there is no planet two or three or like that, we cannot afford it, so we, huh? mm. yes. so that way. It's a ritual we follow, like a religious institution here at Bhutan Dialogues, that we offer two books to our guests, and we ask them what titles they chose and why they chose, very briefly, and I think your books are here. Ah. So these are the two books you chose? Yes. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, can you tell us why these books should be read? Why it should be read? Yes, why you chose these books? <laughs> yes. See, I have not read them myself and that's why I wanted this gift from you. <laughs> <laughs> but, my good friend, former principal of St. Stephen's College, Walton Tampu, who after retirement is now living in, Trivendram Kerala, Thiruvananthapura. I sought his advice and he suggested these two books. And why? It questions organized religions. 
coming from a Christian background, but they are, organ, uh, they are questioning the ritualistic, dogmatic part of it. And there's a beautiful word in English language, which is heresy or heretic. Yeah? Normally it is used for something very, you know, in a sense to uh, sort of denounce. If you do not abide by the religiosity and rituals, you are called a heretic. But this is the age when I am saying doubt, debate, and if necessary, dissent. That means your right to be a heretic has to be asserted. And I have a slogan for that. Heretics of the world unite. <laughs> you have nothing to lose but the chains of your dogma. <laughs> See? So this way, these two books I am looking forward to. Now you are giving me only the <laughs> it's just a <laughs> <the> cover <laughs> of sort of <laughs> The books will be much smaller. Hopefully, I will get it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so yes. much. And here, I would like to share this perspective, a little more clearly, with a real anecdote. When you might have heard about cartoons of uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, published in Denmark newspapers. So there was hue and cry all over the Muslim world and everybody, and many of us denounced it. Around that time, the government of Iran invited me along with other religious leaders of the world for passing a resolution to condemn these cartoons. So I enjoyed this foreign trip and went from Tehran to Isfahan, where put up in Great Hotel Abbasi. And when it was time for everybody to say then, when it was my turn, I got up and said, I have already denounced these cartoons and pictures of Hindu deities on toilet paper by some mischievous elements. But I want to know from you, friends, and there are several ayatollahs of Iran sitting there. Who do you hold higher, Allah or Prophet Muhammad? <coughs> and everybody said, Allah, of course, Allah is the supreme. Prophet was only a messenger. Mm. I said when a prophet's cartoons are published or caricatured, you get so agitated, so agitated all over the world. But when Allah is being caricatured, I never see the Muslim world or anybody getting. And how can you caricature Allah, God? Mm. I said, who creates this creation and the air and the water? And if you are polluting it, are we not making a caricature of Allah, then there was silence. And I said, there is something missing in your kalma. To be a Muslim, most important thing is to recite the kalma. Hmm. La ilaha illillah, Muhammadur Rasulillah. That there is no God but God that is one God. And hmm. Muhammad is the messenger. Hmm. I said, according to my teachings of the Vedas, etc., a slight difference. And I said, my kalma is, La ilaha illillah, zarra zarra rasulillah. Every particle of the universe is the messenger of God, the divine. Oh. My friends thought that I won't be able to go back. <laughs> but the senior most ayatullah embraced me and found out from the organizers when I was returning, said cancel this return flight, take this swami to our seat of learning, Islamic to Kum. For two days, they treated me like their guest and I mm. shared this perspective of Zarra Zarra. Zarra Zarra is a Persian word, mm. which means every particle of the universe is the messenger. Yes. So, environment, water, air, everything, mm. human relations, so all of these are divine inspired. Emanations of the God. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, on that one wonderful, beautiful note, uh, let's give a round of applause to Swamiji. I normally conclude this session with a saying or a proverb from uh, Bhutan's uh, past heritage, but today I decided I'll pick a few verses from the Buddha, from the Dharmapada, uh, as a way of paying tribute to this wonderful spiritual figure. Uh, and this 
these verses, of many verses, there are talks about who is a true Brahmin. And I'll use my rustic Sanskrit as well. Na jatavir na gotrena, na jatya bhavati brahmana, yasmin satyam cha dharmash sa suchi cha brahmana. Yes. Not by matted hair, no by lineage, no by birth does one become a holy man. But he in whom truth and righteousness exist, he is pure, he is a true Brahmin. Nidaya dandam bhuteshu, raseshu stavareshu cha. Yo nahanti nagatayati tam aham bravimi Brahmana. He who has renounced violence towards all living beings, weak or strong, who neither kills nor causes others to kill, him do I call a Brahmin. Aviruddham viruddheshu ata dandeshu nivrittam sadhanishna tanam tam aham bravime brahmanam. He who is friendly amid the hostile, peaceful amidst the violent, unattached amidst the attached, him do I call a Brahmin. Words of Buddha. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please remember my request. If you really want to initiate this type of a larger dialogue, join this movement without any head or headquarter, with your heart quarters, <laughs> young people particularly. Give me your name, number, WhatsApp, so that we will be continuously in dialogue. Thank, Thank you, you so much.